Hi, I'm Erna Bell DeMillo. Welcome to Asian American Life. Today, I'm at the Queens Museum in Fresh Meadows Corona Park. Thousands of visitors come here every year to check out the cool exhibits and artwork like the one behind me, a floor to ceiling mural by the artist Christine Sun Kim. Coming up, I'll take you on a tour of the museum store, which displays many of the items featured on our show. I'll have that story, but first, here's a look at what's ahead on our show. Sing along with Clark on stage. Plus, we dive right into the best seafood market in town, preserving the sport of shirom Korean wrestling. And 20 Summer celebrates art and music, now on Asian American Life. One of my favorite stops in any museum is the museum gift shop. And this one inside the Queens Museum has a very interesting story behind it. Aww. I love your store. Thank you. I'm so happy you're here. <laughs> Christine Jean Jacquet is the proprietor of the Queens Museum gift shop by the August Tree, where every item, every knickknack has a story to tell, even the cookbooks. Immigrant stories. Mm. So the story of food, not as, you know, just cooking, but um, the story of a family through food. And where local Queens artists have found a place on the shelves. We have this math professor from Queens College. His name is Christopher Hanosa. So he makes all these earrings with a um, program called Mathematica. And then he 3D prints them. Oh, so wow. now I've partnered him with a Filipino manufacturer of lamps. So this thing They're gonna turn these into lamps? Yes! <laughs> Jean Jacquet can't hide her excitement for her gift shop and the people behind the product she carries. Maybe because it was a long road to get here. Rewind to 2013. Soon after immigrating to Queens from the Philippines, Jean Jacquet, an industrial designer, and a friend, Billy Dogilo, decided to start an online gift store, hoping to entice Filipinos abroad to buy American goods. Nobody bought but my mom and my high school best friend. So, so um, we, but we realized there was um, people in the local area, they started buying and they liked the merchandise that we had. So 15 days after opening their online shop, they shifted their market to local New York buyers, but it was still tough finding customers. The August Trees pop-up store became a longtime fixture at the Queen's Night Summer Market until a phone call from the market's organizer. He called us and said, you know, the Queen's Museum is looking for a new store owner. Will you be interested? So, um, definitely, definitely. The August Tree opened inside the Queen's Museum in October 2019. And just as they were finally making a profit, the pandemic shut it all down. In New York, a ban on crowds of 500 or more Broadway dark, concert halls and museums set to close. Fortunately for Jean Jacquet, the museum was one of the first institutions to reopen during lockdown. Well, museums and cultural institutions are now allowed to reopen in New York City. We were able to open our store. Um, the thing was, no, nobody else was open, so everybody just came here. They went shopping for books, and uh, since the store is very tiny, we had, we were only allowed to let two people in at a time. So we had a long line. It was so nice, you know, we actually um, took pictures of people lining up for the store. <laughs> Since then, we've been thriving and growing. Jean Jacquet and Dogillo also run the recently opened Unisphere Cafe, where they serve coffee featured on our show, Nguyen Coffee. In fact, when browsing, you may notice several items featured on Asian American Life. And so um, you have cookbooks. Yes. And then all the adult books. Yes. Including some of the books we featured on the show. Yes, yes. <laughs> we bet because you're a big fan of Asian American yes. Life. Yes. We're really, really big fans because the show, you know, makes you feel like, oh, it's, we're seen. <laughs> Feeling seen and belonging are important themes for Jean Jacquet. She gives back by helping other entrepreneurs. During the pandemic, she helped immigrants impacted by COVID start businesses by hosting Zoom workshops called Hecho Local. Some of the attendees turned their passions into products, 
which she now carries in her gift shop. Her name is Talisa Almonte. Her art will go now on, on those products. Oh, wow. So that's our new Echo Local. And so, so you're showcasing all these like really great artists, making yes. them visible. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I, I think it's it. a teacher in me. Yes. I, I feel the need to <laughs> But not just teacher, but you're like a cheerleader. Oh, yeah. I love it. I guess. <laughs> I'm Ernabel DeMillo for Asian American Life. It's a place where dreams are born and stars are made, where the music of the night can ignite a career on stage or screen. And for Clark Mantilla, it's a desire that was calling him from half a world away. Home is in the Philippines. I came from Cebu. Uh, it's in the middle of the country. So home is where I started loving musicals and doing theater. Yeah, home is where it all started. Clark says he started in community theater back home, but that musical theater wasn't overly popular in Cebu. Despite having an undergraduate degree in computer engineering, five years into that computer career, he still yearned for the stage. I started my YouTube channel back in 2016. I did, I experimented on a lot of things. When I started the channel, I started with a, a cover song with musicals. So, and then I alternated um, both content, type of content with duets and then the covers. But somehow the duet versions got picked up by a lot of people. So then I decided to just focus on that. And so Clark created his YouTube channel, Clark On Stage, where he invites visitors to sing along. The channel has over 380,000 subscribers and over 100 million views from people singing with Clark, some even posting their own covers. The success of the channel in some part has to be due to the high production value and personable on-camera accompaniment from Clark and his talented vocals. It's kind of different how I did it. I kind of like elevated it somehow to make it more interactive. Um, I put on my face where I saw another video which they only just showed lyrics and that's fine but I wanted to do something different and make it different. And while for some Clark's channel is a whole lot of fun and perhaps some singing in the shower, Clark was surprised to learn that his channel has helped other aspiring performers reach their goals and land leading roles in major productions. Haiti Sound got a national tour, right? The first person who played Eurydice, uh, Morgan, she actually reached out to me on Instagram and told me that she booked the role using uh, by practicing using my videos. It feels so nice and validating that I kind of help people um, go and live their dreams, I guess. But the success of his YouTube channel wasn't enough. During the pandemic, Clark decided to take a small leap of faith, board a plane, and make his way to New York City. He studied at the New York Film Academy, where he spent the year honing his craft. Clark didn't just come to New York to learn, he also came here to perform. So when he decided to bring his YouTube channel to Don't Tell Mama, we were there to capture the big night. In the cramped confines of a New York City cabaret, Clark was about to spread his wings and his talent. Audience members were asked to write three songs on slips of paper, place them into a bowl, and they were randomly chosen to see who would get to sing with Clark. A challenging evening for any performer, not knowing which song was next or how capable his duet partner would be, but the talent for the evening was off the hook. It felt surreal, you know, because being a Filipino, you would think that Filipinos would enjoy more of my content or like pe my audience would be Filipinos as well. Mm -hmm. But funny enough, when I started the channel, I have more um, U.S. Uh, audience than the Philippines audience. So it felt surreal and at the same time, I felt happy like I get to meet people who are enjoying my content or things that I do online. In addition to Don't Tell Mama, Clark has also performed at 54 Below and Green Room 42, hopefully just the beginning of a very long and productive performing career. I'm Andrew Falzone for Asian American Life. I'm Kyung Yoon at the Aquabest Fish Store on the Lower East Side. And you know, I just learned something useful, that it takes about seven years for a lobster to grow one pound. So that means this friend is probably over 50 years old and a fitting tribute for a store that spans generations. 
Wow. Now, okay. what's a safe way to say hello to him? Like um, this? I always grab it from the bottom. If you want to grab it by yourself, you grab it from the bottom so you be careful there's a little... Meet Stephen Wong, a second-generation seafood expert and owner of Aquabest, an unassuming seafood market on the Lower East Side that has an impressive variety of fresh fish, oysters, crabs, and yes, the lobsters. This is a male. And this is a female. The male Wong knows his lobsters, right having had to learn the ropes from an early age after his father passed away in 1987, leaving his mother to run the business by herself. I am the youngest of four, so she had four kids. We were very, very poor um, when my father passed away. She brought us into the family business where everyone had to help out. So. Even uh, at eight years old, during uh, elementary school, after school, I would actually have to help, um, you know, pack lobster or pack conch um, and help out the family. Today, Aquabest is the largest purveyor of lobsters in New York, supplying premium seafood to New York City's top Michelin starred chefs and hundreds of other restaurants and customers in the Northeast. Being a child of hardworking Chinese immigrants, Stephen says he's proud to be a bridge between cultures and generations. I'm American, I'm a Chinese American. I have Chinese values and cultures. I have American values and cultures, but I'm able to bridge these things together because if you think about the restaurant industry, it's not just American, it's not just French, it's not just Italian, but they all come from different parts of the world and we all have the same story that like, hey, I, I want to do something Western here, but I want to bring something from back home. I think this is where like, we can bridge these things together, and I think that's an advantage that I have. Before the pandemic, Aquabest only sold seafood to restaurants, but after COVID hit and the restaurants closed, they made a decision to keep their doors open for ordinary customers. Early pandemic, uh, for the first 90 days, I never closed one day out of the shop. Not one day, not during the riots, not during early pandemic. And I would actually open the store early just for senior citizens to come shop. The New York Times included Stephen in its photo essay of New York City's service workers who kept the city going during the darkest months of lockdown. And it, what we didn't think about was fishermen still needed a fish to make money, but consumers still needed products to eat. So we kind of like combined them too, and we opened up to the public. Stephen shared with me some expert tips on how to tell if fish is fresh. There is probably three things that you need to know. Um, one is you look at the eyes. It's really mm -hmm. clear mm -hmm. on it and it's, it's, it's puffy, right? Oh, and not it, sunken. Not sunken. Okay. Um, number two is you're going to touch it. You can touch it and it's a little firm. It's not mushy. Yeah. And the third is always about smell. And Stephen's advice for the next generation, it's whatever you do, always aim to be the best. I'm Kyung Yoon for Asian American Life. When you talk about sports from South Korea, most people think of Taekwondo. But one man is making it his mission to teach and promote the lesser known traditional national sport of Shiram. Using only sapa, sand, and strategy, these opponents are practicing the ancient form of Korean wrestling called shiram, which dates back thousands of years to the 4th century. The draw of the energy between the crowd um, with my opponent and the feel of the sand. Um, it's unlike any other martial art. And even though it may look like the Japanese sport of sumo wrestling, shiram is decidedly different. Taking place in a sand pit where competitors face off, wearing a cloth belt around their waist and thighs called sappa. The objective is to bring any part of your opponent's body above the knee to the ground. Not by overpowering them, but rather outbalancing them. According to Mr. Sang Hyung Kim, who has spent the last 30 years teaching and promoting shiram in the United States. There's no punching, there's no kicking, there's no chokes. It's mere, purely the form of balance and a very gentleman way of uh, transcending someone's energy to another. Which effectively means wrestlers don't use brute force. 
a method that appeals to even the most seasoned mixed martial artist. I love how it's just the like camaraderie. Everyone's so like happy and kind. Like we're all, and you take someone down, you lift them back up, and you rub their the sand off their back, and you give them a big hug. And it's always like the whole crowd is smiling. It's a very good atmosphere, um, different than a lot of you know combat sports that I've been a part of. The unique form of folk wrestling is thought to have developed in ancient Korea, when bare hands were the only weapons to help people survive against predators. Later, shirim was used in military operations, and then became a popular pastime with tournaments being held at holiday celebrations and festivals. In 2018, shirim was added to the UNESCO Intangible Cultural Heritage List, which seeks to protect and preserve cultural treasures, a mission directly aligned with Mr. Kim's. A lot of you know, Korean Americans will go without any cultural background or traditional take backs, but through this sport, he wants everyone of every nation to know that, hey, we have a traditional sport in Korea, be proud of it, no matter what your cultural background is, this is ours, but we'll teach you regardless. Over the past few decades, Mr. Kim has spent considerable time and money trying to preserve the sport of shirim, teaching at his church in Great Neck, Long Island, and at summer camps, as well as competing in tournaments and performing at festivals throughout the city, drawing new interest in this ancient art form. Nowadays, more and more the younger people are fascinated with the Shiram's ideas. You have to think a little bit differently because you start with the grip, which is very different than Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or Judo where you have to work your way into getting the grip. A grip that Mr. Kim hopes will hold on to a new generation of Shiram fans. Culturally, in our background, since back 5,000 years ago, this was always the highlight of any fall festival. That rush, that resurgence of energy is what he wanted to uh, send off to everyone who is interested in Shiram. If you are interested in Shiram, Mr. Kim and his students will be competing at the Korean American Sports Festival at the end of June. For Asian American Life, I'm Susan Jun. I'm Vivian Lee. Thousands of years ago, poetry bound the earliest humans together in spoken form. Even in today's digital world, poetry has a purpose. That's according to one of CUNY's own, a poet who's being recognized with an honor many poets dream of. After leaving Raksruha, after crossing Mexico with a coyote. Rhythm and sound are gateways to meaning for poet and distinguished professor Kamiko Han. After reaching at midnight, that barren New Mexico border, a man and his daughter looked to Antelope Wells for asylum and were arrested. When I was a little girl, uh, my mother would read stories to me, and I loved the sound of the words. After forms read in Spanish to the Mayan-speaking father, after a cookie but no water, after the wait for the lone bus, I was enamored by the power of words and the playfulness of words. After boarding, after the little girl's temperature spiked, she suffered two heart attacks, vomited, and stopped breathing. Art should be a given in one's life. I think the point of life is stimulation. And uh, after food and shelter, I think human stimulation is oftentimes art. As one of four new chancellors elected to the Academy of American Poets this year, Kamiko Han will be an ambassador for poets and their art. She's published 10 collections of her own poems, earned fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts, and for 29 years has taught at Queens College, currently teaching creative writing and literary translation in the MFA program. As a former board member of the Poetry Society of America, the ones responsible for putting poetry in New York subway cars, she wants to use her new position with the Academy to bring more poetry into people's frenetic lives. There is self-awareness involved uh, and self, well, let's say self-connection and connecting the self to the outer world as well. 
the one she reads here from her collection Foreign Bodies offers that connection. She wrote it after reading a news article. The coroner examined the failed liver and swollen brain. Then Jacqueline's chest and head were stitched up and she returned to Guatemala in a short white coffin to her mother, grandparents, and dozens of women preparing tamales and beans to feed the grieving. Writing for people who have otherwise been marginalized is really a political act and giving my students an opportunity to express themselves is, for me, is a political act as well. Han also studies and teaches Zuihitsu, a form of writing from 10th century Japan, when Han says a golden age of literature flourished thanks to women. Neither poem nor poetic essay, and meaning running brush, the Zuihitsu is characterized by a lack of structure found in Western poems. Han published her own book of Zuihitsu, The Narrow Road to the Interior. When I was a young woman and just really starting out, there weren't a lot of published Asian American writers. Uh, there weren't a lot of Asian American teachers, for that matter. Being an Asian American poet and teacher has meant that I'm also a model, I'm a mentor, and for students who are not Asian American, I'm someone who is different as part of their diverse, increasingly diverse community. And that's really, really important to me. April is National Poetry Month, and Han says she's inspired by the O oh Miami Poetry Festival's use of mundane objects, parking tickets, rooftops, grocery store items, to showcase poetry. If you look up and read a poem on the subway, you are connecting with someone who you don't know. And that connection makes you reflect. Turning the banal into something extraordinary, one word at a time. For Asian American Life, I'm Vivian Lee. Singer-songwriter Julianne Saporiti's No No Boy Project is unlike anything you've heard before. Folk songs about the Asian American experience. I caught up with Julian Saporiti in Provincetown, Massachusetts, where he is an artist in residence at 20 Summers, an arts organization run by a CUNY film professor. The only swing band left in Wyoming. Julian Saporiti has a PhD in Asian American history, but instead of publishing pages of an academic paper, he turned his dissertation into discography with a series of songs about the Asian American experience. What the No No Boy Project is all about, kind of just using folk songs to, to reveal these histories that a lot of us never learn about. Oh, he left the band to Tet. Joy went with her family to DC. As for Yoni, he had to join the war. Instead of just like the three people on my dissertation committee, now I go on tour and get to put out music and share all this history with people. Saporiti is one of a handful of Asian American artists and residency recipients at 20 Summers, a nonprofit that imagines a more equitable future by incubating original work in this historic barn in Provincetown, Massachusetts. Welcome to the Hawthorne Barn. This space was built by Charles Hawthorne in 1907 as the Cape Cod School of Art. Alice Gong is the program director at 20 Summers, which attracts artists from New York City and around the country. When we were talking about our residents this year, I'm like, why don't we get some Asian Americans artists here? Maybe they'll be inspired to be in the same room. This is a No No Boy. It's concerts later on tonight. CUNY film professor Aziz Aisham is 20 Summers executive director. One of the reasons why Julian's work really spoke to us was that his work is, is absolutely beautiful. The songs are absolutely moving and touching and they're unlike anything you've ever heard before. Saporiti incorporates field recordings from historic sites and oral histories from individuals into each of his songs. Mom said if you keep up with school, joy you can sing. 
Uh, you know, he doesn't just sing love songs and breakup songs. He sings songs about kind of untold stories of Asian American history. Saparita grew up in Nashville, Tennessee. His mother, a painter who fled the war in Vietnam after her grandfather was killed by a grenade in their home. Oh, 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 She's out in 68, and she doesn't see any family member again for a decade, never sees her dad again. While attending Berklee College of Music, he toured with an indie rock band in his early 20s. Burnt out from the road, he moved to Wyoming, where his education about Asian American history took root while learning about the 1885 Rock Springs Massacre, in which 150 white miners killed 28 Chinese workers. And the Heart Mountain Relocation Center, where 14,000 Japanese Americans were incarcerated during World War II. And what really got me into it was I saw this picture of a jazz band that formed at that Heart Mountain Detention Center. And as a musician, Asian American musician, I never really saw myself, especially not in old black and white photos of like pop musicians growing up. So that was like a lineage for me. The George Igawa Orchestra, which formed at the Heart Mountain Relocation Center and then toured outside the prison camp throughout Wyoming during World War II, is a subject of this No No Boy song. The best goddamn band in Wyoming. Despite being behind barbed wire, brought their instruments, put on dances for people, and really uh, persevered, made the most out of such a horrible situation. Can you give the world a twist? Saporiti says his time at 20 Summers is a respite from touring with the weighty subjects of his songs and a chance for him and his wife and co-producer Amelia Halverson to work on their new album for Smithsonian Folkways, including a song about the first Asian Americans who visited Oregon in 1603, 17 years before the Pilgrims landed here in Provincetown, Massachusetts. I do want folks like myself, like those Asians in the middle of the country, to hear these songs. Be like, maybe if they do feel not a place of belonging, they can hold on to some of this. But you know, it's also for just like the good people who raised me, those like white Republicans who raised me in Tennessee, those red staters too, right? Using history, that's a big part of the project. Using these songs as a Trojan horse, as a teacher, you know, I can go to a cowboy bar or a church and play some folk songs. And I got you, man. We're talking about immigration at the bar after this show. No No Boy is on tour this summer playing at the Smithsonian Folklife Festival in D.C. on July 6th. For Asian American Life, I'm Rainer Ramirez. That's our show for now. Be sure to visit the Queen's Museum and, of course, the gift shop. And if you want more information on our show, be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at Asian American Life. And watch July 4th, our special on the 70th anniversary of the Korean armistice between Korea and the U.S. That's right here on CUNY TV. I'm Ernabel DeMillo. We'll see you next time. <laughs>